Hello, welcome to our March webinar Wednesday session. Um, I hope you're all safe and sound in these uh, really crazy days. Um, my name is Sasha Avada. I'm the Educations Director at FUSE, and I will be your uh, webinar host for today. Uh, some housekeeping notes before we start. I mean, you have all been put on mute, um, except for the presenters. So for the presenters, if you are not talking, please put yourself on mute as well. Um, for those attendees, you can always um, post your questions at any time in the chat window. Um, we will go through them at the end of the um, webinar. And this webinar will also be recorded, so you will be able to exit, this, exit it uh, later from, from our website. Um, we have a pretty packed agenda today, so this is what we are going to talk about. Uh, so I will start with uh, some important updates from FUSE. Um, and um, then we will uh, hear some exciting updates from our working groups. And so first, uh, we will hand over to Michael, uh, Jolene, um, Gretchen, and uh, Leslie. Uh, we will hear about recommendations for the anti-drug uh, antibody uh, modeling in, in Send IG. Um, and then we will pass over to Tim Williams from UCB, uh, who will um, give us an update about a very new, um, exciting working group project about study data validation and submission conformance. Okay, but before we go there, I would like to, to give you some important uh, updates um, from the FUSE board. So you all should know that uh, we unfortunately had to cancel our US Connect event in Orlando. Um, over the past weeks, we, we have been extremely busy to manage the entire situation and uh, also to ensure that all of our presenters who worked so hard on their presentations and papers, that they can share the knowledge. So we worked uh, on the virtualization of the entire event and already shared a few presentations and webinars uh, in early March. Um, recordings of all presentations, um, of almost all presentations, um, are currently uploaded um, and will be made available in the next day. So you can um, watch them on our Fuse uh, Tube channel. Uh, this is also the place where you will uh, usually find our, our webinar recordings. Um, also, the, we, we had a big new thing uh, happening or planned for Orlando, uh, the FUSE FDA Data Science Challenge. This is also um, now a virtual event. And we now have Innovation Friday sessions every Friday uh, for the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's where um, our, um, yeah, um, our, our stream attendees uh, will share very nice innovation ideas um, on, on three very relevant um, topics uh, for the FDA. Um, so please um, check out your, your, um, your inbox and uh, it would be great if you could attend these Innovation Fridays. We also worked intensively with um, the event organization here and are happy to share that we will be back in Orlando in 2021 and that US Connect uh, 2022 two uh, will be held in, in Atlanta. Uh, so more information on that uh, will be shared uh, from April on. With regards to the CSS, um, you might have seen uh, the emails that we had to postpone this until September. New dates are currently Monday 21st uh, to Wednesday uh, 23rd of September. Uh, the registration and also the call for paper um, will open uh, quite soon. Um, and if you are a member of the working groups, uh, you will also hear uh, some more information um, in, these, in these working groups. Um, with regards to our European um, Connect event, uh, which is uh, scheduled for, uh, no, for early November in Liverpool, uh, right now we fully anticipate um, that the European Connect event will be unaffected by the COVID-19 situation. The call for paper is already open um, and the registration will open uh, quite soon in the second quarter as well. Um, so that's it from my side. Um, I would now like to hand over uh, to our working group. Um, so Lauren, if you could um, please hand over to uh, Jardine who will present for the working group. Thank you. Jardine, over to you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, I'm happy to be presenting on behalf of the uh, non-clinical uh, working group on modeling anti-drug antibody data, uh, commonly uh, shortened to ADA. 
uh, and I will be most likely using that term throughout. Uh, so what we're talking about today is the uh, accumulation of a couple of years work uh, in that was also done uh, in collaboration with uh, CDIS progress on a separate initiative. So we went back and forth and really made sure that this is very well aligned with uh, some of the other expectations that you may be hearing about from other uh, regulatory agencies. Okay. So what we'll be talking about uh, in the context of the ADA data in SEND is start by reviewing the agency expectations around the SEND data format, highlighting a few key uh, elements that are different between 3.0 and 3.1, which are uh, aspects that uh, are critical to how ADA data is modeled. Uh, a brief introduction on ADA assays for those of you unfamiliar with the goal of these methods and the way they are different from PK methods. And then work through some example data sets that are, well, really one example data set that is in the white paper as well, so that you can follow along and understand how, how the data flow really works here and then some wrap-up information and uh, the q and I understand will be at the very end of the session, but please do put, um, put your questions in the chat uh, as we go, because if it's a clarifying question, I'll try and get back to it right away, uh, but any questions on the more detailed will hold uh, to the very end. So, FDA CEDAR is now requiring SEND 3.0 for studies that started between uh, December 2016 and uh, March 2019, uh, and INDs between uh, for the one year period after that. And then SEND 3.1 is required for all studies that start after those dates above. And so you can see that we are, are we have now passed the dates where uh, I, IND studies starting now, all have to be in SEND 3.1. Uh, one of the chat and the information linked here is a bit more about the expectations. FDA CBER is not requiring SEND, but many companies are using the same versions of SEND simply because uh, it, it actually is quite helpful to put your model data into the SEND models. Uh, and have, uh, because it streamlines all of the reporting activities as well. One of the, uh, here's here are some additional links on the data standards catalog for you to learn more about the SEND format. Uh, these are ha active hyperlinks, so we'll be, you'll be able to uh, use these uh, in the, the recording and the slides. The key difference between SEND 3.0 versus 3.1 for the purposes of immunogenicity reporting is that we, the SEND 3.1 allows the custom domain. And this is important because the domain that is being recommended for use in the clinic is the IS domain, which does not exist in SEND 3.0 or SEND 3.1. However, you could use it as a custom domain if you uh, are using SEND 3.1. And that is uh, the recommendation of our team, just as a preview. Uh, SEND 3.2 will have the IS domain. And uh, as another preview for active upcoming next steps, uh, anti-drug antibody assays are measuring an immunogenic response. And if you are familiar with vaccines, it's very similar, except for instead of the antigen that you're measuring the humoral ten, uh, uh, antibodies against, you're measuring antibodies that are against the drug you have administered, which is generally unwanted as opposed to wanted for vaccine studies. Uh, the readout is quasi-quantitative. Uh, there is no true reference standard because 
every individual will have their own polyclonal response. Uh, the format is typically a homogenous bridging assay to uh, enable detection of antibodies regardless of their FC domain. And instead of uh, formal quality controls, there's more just positive and negative controls where you're expecting the result to fall within a range. And then there is a statistically determined assay cut point that's used to define whether a sample is positive or negative. This is somewhat similar to a limit of detection. Uh, however, it doesn't have a quantitative numbers per se because it doesn't have a reference standard. The tiered strategy is uh, indicates that after you get one result, you need to get a couple more results before you're fully done. And that will depend on how an individual study is set up. For most non-clinical samples and most non-clinical studies, it starts with a screening assay, uh, which is just a single dilution to see if it's the sample is positive or negative at the, at the most concentrated. Uh, we typically skip the confirmatory assay, which is done for clinic, uh, but is covered in the manuscripts linked. Uh, and then there may or may not be a titer assay, which is uh, done from a serial dilution off of, based off of the screening assay dilution, by which case you're looking to prepare that quasi-quantitative value as opposed to the binary result of positive, negative. And in addition, after you've done this for each sample, for, for each uh, animal, uh, you need an overall assessment of whether that animal is being considered positive for, for ADA. Uh, and there are a variety of different rules that can be used. So when I talk about a bridging assay format, what you can see here is two different platforms that are frequently used for immunogenicity. And you can see that in the middle here, the anti-drug antibody and, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the anti-drug antibody here is uh, the, the same thing as in the right, what is called is drug. Uh, so actually in the right, there's a, it's a, I forgot to change those, but so let's look at the one on the left. The anti-drug antibody is what you're trying to measure, but your drug is what you're using as the reagent. So you have the biotinylated drug or a sulfotag conjugated drug, and you optimize the assay to find the conditions that, that most favor this one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship, which is taking advantage of the fact that your ADA is bivalent against your drug. Uh, and then what you do is you capture this whole thing that's been run in solution with an analyte that's coded to a plate, uh, uh, which is streptavidin. So now you have streptavidin, biotinylated drug, ADA, sulfotrag conjugated drug, and in the MSD platform, the way you detect this is you run an electrical charge through the electrode, which causes a signal to be um, uh, emitted uh, from this sulfotag. It's also been done where it is you're, it's set up like an ELISA, and this may be a um, like any of the, the enzymatic readouts that we typically use or it could be a fluorescent tag uh, or a, uh, a, a chemiluminescence tag, all sorts of things uh, that would depend on the actual platform. This is not the format of every assay, but it is the format of most assays. For more information on what anti-drug antibodies are and the expectations to include the data, uh, you can see these three guidance documents, which are final. There are also a variety of draft guidance documents, but I have not linked them because until they're final, they don't really count. And then there's uh, three industry white papers, which we feel would be very helpful for you to have a better understanding of designing the assays and optimizing them, uh, the risk-based strategies for when you would be having different types of testing schematics, 
as well as the validation of these assays because it again goes into the expectations for assay performance. An example testing schematic, uh, again, now I'm going into more detail here on what was on the earlier slide. But if you start with a screening assay, you will get a uh, either a negative or positive result. And if you get a negative result, you stop testing. If you get a positive result, you would go into a confirmatory assay where if it was negative, again, you are done testing. If it's positive, you keep going. Now, when you don't have a confirmatory assay, you just kind of go straight from this to the quasi quantitation. Uh, and there are some better diagrams for that in the uh, uh, in the white paper as well as in a, in a few slides coming up. And then when you have quasi quantitation, you get some kind of uh, readout coming out. Uh, we wanted to call this variable quasi quantify. However, that is used elsewhere in standard terminology. So we have the uh, test purpose of quantify, but please keep in mind that it's not true quantification, it's really a relative scale. So now that we are thinking about that tiered assay strategy, we're gonna show you how you model this data in the IS domain. Of course, you will have all of the sample information in the various fields, including sampling day, animal number, all of that information. And what we're focusing on is the domains that are uh, will help identify your sample as an ADA sample. Uh, and then uh, in the later example, I'm gonna show you how you would model in certain types of results into the result columns that are standard across the domains. So we have here on the left, the three stages that would be in for individual samples, plus then the subject status. For Sended 3.1, we were able to use the IS domain. <laughs> we have all of them with the same test code, uh, the ADA underscore BAB, and it carries through and the IS test code is the same. The way that we are distinguishing between screening, confirmation, and quantification, quasi-quantification, is the ISTSTOPO, which is a uh, is using a uh, dash dash TSTOPO in the sense that we are now using screen, confirm, quantify, or blank. Blank is for subject status. The other ones are for individual sample status. Uh, and then this is only needed in uh, the send, not SDTM, because this is all done in the atom for SDTM. And the other, uh, we have the category of anti-drug antibodies to help people find all of the anti-drug data quickly. And then we have another, uh, don't, another custom variable for SDTM, but will hopefully soon be a standard variable, which is binding agent. And where this comes in is what assay, what are you actually using as the reagent in your assay? Uh, this, you can see that in the previous example, uh, I have just one, and so we're gonna assume it's therapeutic X, but you could also have and, uh, you know, other assays where you're measuring the specificity to a endogenous where we would be using cross-reactive antibodies. Uh, and there's also a whole tier for neutralizing antibodies as well, but they follow the same schematic here and are outlined in the white paper. Now, when you go to the SEND 3.0, unfortunately, we are in the position <laughs> where we can't use the IS domain because it's incompatible to use custom domains. So instead, what we looked at is how can we make the same information fit within the lab, the laboratory test domain. And the way we had to do that is we had to take the test purpose and combine it into test code and, uh, and test. So with character limits, you can see that we've kind of truncated some of these. Uh, and then we have for the added the S 
C or Q to the end of the test code, and then blank for the uh, subject status. Again, we are using the category, but because we can't have the binding agent, we are repurposing the, the, the subcategory, um, or you could use some other supplement thing to put in the specificity towards the test article. Uh, this is not a preferred way because obviously this is not what subcategory is meant to be, but we deem it to be a standard variable rather than a, uh, or you at least need to be aware that there's data in the supplementary domains where you, do, you need this information to unambiguously interpret the results. So I mentioned that the doing just a screening assay is off, is very common for not for non-clinical studies uh, that would be in SEND. And if you're doing just a screening assay, all of your results are going to have these shared test code. Uh, again, I'm switching to uh, I'm, all of the rest of the examples are going to be for 3.1, uh, but there are. Uh, the same examples are provided with uh, 3.0 using the LB domain in the white paper. Our test purpose is screening and our binding agent is our drug, which I have called therapeutic X. And so all of your results will have this type, this information in those three fields in the, uh, the, the data tables. However, if you have a titration, uh, this example shows that if you have a negative result, you have no further data, but anything that's positive will have another line of data for the quasi quantitation uh, that's tighter or other. So you'll see results that have both this information and this information in, in it. Now, going back to the 3.1 table, that means that your, your lines will have information that looks like this. You'll have the ADA BAB, binding anti-drug antibody, therapeutic X, anti-drug antibody screen. You're not using confirmation. So you'll have rows that are the quasi-quantitation again uh, with the test purpose of quantify. And you'll have the subject status, which is blank in test purpose. It would be great in an ideal world if everybody had this data coming from your analytical lab in exactly this format. However, we all know that if we go back to studies that were run in uh, 2017, you may or may not have anything that looks like this. So what we have also provided in the, the uh, white paper is how do you take a report that may be a contributing report to a talk study and extract a data set to convert it to the send format. So this is just an example data set. Uh, what we have is the, uh, we have six animals and we have six time points. And for each result, we see that there's either a negative or a positive result. And then there's an 80 and day instruction Production status and a prevalence. Well, you start with this, and then I, we created a flow chart to help you work through what rows you're going to need to put in. So, if you have numeric values we provided for any individual sample result, then we say, okay, you're going to need a quantify. Uh, and then you would map each numeric result to quantify with the units that you can determine from the table description. And each numeric result also has an implied positive. So if there's a confirmatory step, uh, you follow the down arrow, uh, uh, which we don't have, you would follow the down arrow. And But we're going to talk about the more common example where there is no confirmatory step which means you then map the positive and negative results to screen. So when you go from that data table to an example data set then, 
what you can see now, and this is just a partial table, the whole table is in the white paper, that for every result that we had ha seen as uh, a, a result that said negative, in addition to the terms that we had previously discussed, uh, the test purpose is screen, the result, the ISORRES and ISS TRESC are both negative, and you can see that the visit day is captured and the subject ID to make this a unique row. When you get to samples that had numbers, the screen result is listed as positive, and the quantify result is listed as a number with the unit of titer. And then when you go into the ISS, uh, TRESN now is where you have the numeric result instead of the categorical result and the titer. When you look across a subject, uh, I'll just quickly go back, uh, I have in red here what the rules are for whether you consider them in, as a positive or a negative uh, result. And so then I can have this line here. It wouldn't be in red, it's just in red for ease of reference. You can see we have an empty test purpose and we're calling the, the subject positive and positive. And then a really key aspect here is flagging it as a derived value. Uh, this is important in SEND because it contains both uh, raw data and the above lines, as well as the derived data and such and in this case is the patient status. Uh, and it does not have a visit day because it carries across all of the data. We ha have the links here to the uh, ADA FUSE page. Uh, if we get questions that aren't covered by the current examples, we would be providing more in the future. And then the white paper. Um, when we have the Sendig 3.2, we will most likely be providing an update to the white paper at that time. Uh, and uh, hopefully that would be within the next couple of years, but you all need to do your send now. So what's going on at CDISC with the IS domain status beyond what we are proposing now within FUSE to use for the send? The, the SDTEM uh, molecular biology team has been working on an IS domain in parallel with these efforts addressing ADA. And our current uh, 3.1 proposal is fully aligned with the version that is currently being vetted inside of uh, CDISC and will likely go out for public comment in the very near future. In addition, the CDISC SEND team is working on an IS domain, which would include ADA and all of the other IS domain methodology uh, for SENDIG 3.2, so that all of these proposals that we've come up as a working solution could be incorporated into a final version for a full release. And we have had cross-team participation across the FUSE efforts and both of these CDISC efforts to assist in consistency whenever appropriate for these, uh, these the, across both the CDISC terms for both SEND and STTM. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And um, the, I'm gonna quickly uh, answer uh, a question I, I see about is log tighter the default value? No, it is not. Every company has their own, but you can read, it will be described in the context. Uh, I see a lot of straight tighter, and I will also go into the chat now that I will pass off the speaking again uh, so that you can, uh, to answer some of the questions in parallel with the speakers, and then of course come back on along with uh, Gretchen, Leslie, and Michael to answer questions uh, related to this topic as well. So I'll pass it on to uh, 
pass it back to Fuse so that they can then pass it on to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you, Jolene. Um, the next presentation uh, will be given by Tim Williams. Um, Lauren, could you hand it over to Tim, please? Thank you, uh, Sasha and Lauren. I assume you can hear me okay and also see my slides at this time? Absolutely. Yeah, Great, thank you. And thanks everyone for having me at the session today to talk about a new project within the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group called Study Data Validation and Submission Conformance. It is not evident from the title, but it's actually a project that deals with linked data that we will explore a little bit uh, in the slides today. So I'm the project lead. I am joined by Dr. Oliva as the ontology development consultant. And we'll talk about staffing up the project near the end as well, where you will have an opportunity to join us, I hope. The project is a unique collaboration this time, not just for FUSE members across the various pharma and biotechs, but also involving the FDA, mostly in the preclinical. Well, always embarrassing when your phone goes off during the middle of a presentation, but there you go, working from home. And uh, we're also looking for some collaboration with academia. And I'm, that uh, organization there, identifying them is pending right now because we're still looking into some finalizing of the agreements. But I can tell you it's a university that's very well known in the linked data space. Now, the challenges we are trying to address are quite well known to many of us. And some of them stem from the file format that we are dealing with from the 1980s, the infamous SAS transport, but more so even the row by column data structures that we have across various applications. You'll recall that from the 1980s, our cell phones looked like this. Well, technology has proceeded much uh, without us in terms of how we're storing our data and we need to modernize. Still, our industry standards and our instance data itself is in row by column structures that it's very inflexible and not very future-proof. A recent retrospective by the FDA found that 32% of submissions had some type of conformance issue in the data. Now, this does not mean that the submission was rejected, just that there was a detectable problem with the data. We can and must do much better. Our approach in this project is a bit unique. We are not just taking existing standards and mapping them to graph data. We're actually looking at the process of these studies, clinical and preclinical, modeling the entities or things within them and the relationships between those things. So you'll have something like a study has a treatment arm, a subject is assigned to a treatment arm. And when you start to graph it out this way, you come to the realization what we're talking about here is something called resource description framework or RDF. It's a very simple data model where we map a subject to an object with a semantically meaningful predicate between the two values. So we will be developing a knowledge graph approach using resource description framework and semantic technologies. There's two parts to this project. The first is study validation and the second is submission conformance. The study validation component will look at modeling the FDA validation rules using something called shapes constraint language or shackle. And it is also based on RDF, the familiar subject predicate object. I won't go into a lot of the details with this today, but just to show you conceptually, what we're designing here is, that our, is around the fact that a data should have shape, right? So you have a study subject, animal subject, human study subject, and that data should have things like age, gender, assignment to a treatment arm. We consider that the shape that the data should fit in. So you run these constraints against your data and you see what data fits your shape and what does not. What does not is then reported in a validation report. And you can use those constraints also when you're collecting your data to ensure high quality at that time. The second piece, submission conformance, looks at the format and content completeness using the FDA standards catalog and modeling those rules with the goal of increasing automation of submission meta metadata collection and also leveraging the data validation rules that we form around the instance data itself. This is the collaboration with academia that I'm talking about. And all of this work, both aspects, will follow fair principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So everything about this project, including the slide deck from today, will be available on our GitHub site. Mentioning the site, I'd like to take you over to the website that we are developing at this time. 
And it'll take us just a moment to get there. The internet tubes are a little bit busy with everyone working from home. So we're just starting to develop this site. And as you'll see, it is broken down into our two main components for the project, data validation and submission conformance. And I wanted to, to just show you a little bit under the shapes validation area to show you how we are approaching the project and how these things tie together. The FDA has a number of rules and we are breaking them down here and modeling them. We're just getting started, so only a couple of rules to start with. Let's take a look at the rule around unique subject identifier. In the FDA validator rules spreadsheet, there's the rule 83, which surrounds the unique subject identifier. And to us as people, this makes sense because we have some intuition about what unique means. And the rule states the identifier is used to uniquely identify a subject across studies. But we need to break that down into its components so we can model it so it is understandable by both the machine and the person. So there are essentially three components to this. The first is that an animal subject cannot have more than one unique subject identifier. Also, an animal subject cannot have a missing identifier. And then lastly, a unique subject identifier value cannot be assigned to more than one animal subject. So that's how we break this down and we model it. And this is the pattern we will follow for all of the rules, rules we create. We create a pseudo English, pseudo shackle statement here that helps us build the rule. We describe the rule, develop some data to test it. In this case here, we have an animal subject identifier and note that it has two unique subject identifiers, thus tripping a validation constraint. We'll see this one again in a moment. Here's another animal that has no use subject ID, also tripping up on rule 83. I won't go into the details here. It gets a little bit technical and a bit boring for those of you who aren't technical nerds like myself, but uh, we show how we build the shapes. We test them with test data, and it then results in a report when we run the constraint against that data, and we verify it with the Sparkle query language, which is the query language for the RDF data. But what I really wanted to show you here was the visualization of how all of this comes together. So just zoom in on this a little bit here. And here we have the instance data in blue. So this is an animal subject and its unique identifier. It has a unique subject identifier of this value and also of this value. So there are two unique subject IDs. So this should be a violation. We write the rules in shackle, which is also in graph language. So here we've defined the constraint has min one max one shape for the unique subject identifier. This states that there should only be a minimum of one and a maximum of one ID. It is attached to the instance data through a relationship called SH path, which tells the constraint to look at this path through the data and apply it to things that are animal subjects. And this is linked over to our instance data here. When we run this constraint, it generates a report. The report is here in this light beige or light yellow color which is also attached both to its constraint that created it and to the instance data. So we see this result is linked to this animal subject identifier. It is linked through the path as is the constraint and it generates a message that was defined in the constraint information here saying we have a, viol a violation of rule 83. So this is just really to show you how all of these things, the instance data, the rules, and the validation report are intimately connected when you follow linked data principles. So now I'll go back over to our slides. This really relates to a much bigger picture of where we need to go to in the future for pharma. You may have heard of enterprise knowledge graphs that model the people, um, the various applications, um, everything in your enterprise. Well, we need to also think about our study data also being a graph and participating in this. So we have biostatisticians working on the data. They would be represented in both the enterprise graph and the study data graph. You might have data coming in from other sources like publishing, marketing, or other data sources, standards that you apply to the data. We need to have those in graph form and regulatory rules, things like the shackle that I was showing you earlier today. And this would then form a common pharmaceutical industry knowledge graph that we should all contribute to and have free access to be able to leverage. This will support a lot of new initiatives, things like increased data quality, easing data integration difficulties, lead to process and robotic process automation, 
and support all the new shiny toys like machine learning, AI, and so on. The impact here is profound. It is a paradigm shift to a data-centric approach for pharma, leading to higher data quality, successful submissions. We'll be able to gain new insights from our data, but the main point to make here is we will be able to deliver our therapies to patients much more rapidly. To do this, we need your help. I'm looking for a project co-lead, preferably someone who has both ontology and clinical experience, so you know the clinical trial process or the pre-clinical study process very well to help us model that. If you have experience with some of the modeling tools like Protege, Web Protege, or Top Rate, or want to learn, or if you'd like to learn more about linked data, you have some R experience, maybe some Python or Markdown, or just want to learn, please consider joining us by sending an email to the address here. And even if you want to just come and listen in to see what we're all about, we'd love to have you. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for the great presentation. Um, we have quite a lot of um, questions already received. Um, Lauren, can you pass over the uh, presentation rights to me as well? Um, again. So here's the, the first question is for um, for Gret, um, for 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 Jolene. So the question is: um, Is there any particular requirement for an essay sensitivity or LPC level? Jolene, can you? Yeah. Uh, sorry, it took me a while to hit the right unmute oh, button. No worries. Um, the, there are. There are a lot of requirements around assay development and validation. And uh, this is something people can have full day conferences on. Uh, the FDA gu and guidance on method validation and the EMA guidance are good places for you to understand what those are. However, all guidances have their exceptions and there's quite lively debate on what those exceptions are in two uh, additional nonprofit organizations, the AAPS uh, Bioanalytical Community and the EIP, which is the European Immunogenicity Platform. Uh, I would hope that all of you would have coworkers from the bioanalytical groups who are actively involved in that. Uh, that can also help you navigate the extensive literature and uh, industry development in those areas as well. If you don't have an internal person and would like to uh, reach out to me, um, I am always happy to help people. You'll find me on LinkedIn. You can message me directly, or uh, you can email me at my uh, my work email address, which is jolene.white at gatesmri.org. Thank you. Okay. Here's another question for you. Um, do you know how many sponsors use um, SN instead of TETA? Uh, in, in the US, most sponsors are using TITER, but in, the, in Europe, there's still a heavy use of signal to noise. And there are other units as well, including things like uh, you know, percent signal uh, of max. Uh, there, there are some that are just doing uh, are doing the log tighter versus raw tighter. The example I showed was using log log dilution factor as, um, but a lot of companies use the raw dilution factor. Uh, there's there's a lot of different formats. Uh, it is helpful. Uh, when you're using a company standard, uh, it is helpful to define, uh, at least in the source report, what they mean by tighter if they are using tighter, and you can tell that from the method uh, protocol, typically. Uh, and but it really is really open, and and therefore the units were also intentionally left open for the whatever someone might might be entering there. Uh, because it is it's, it's highly dependent on the individual assay and the, the company standards at the time that assay was developed and validated. Okay, thanks. So here, here's another question, or actually two. Um, what if the units are not in lock uh, form for the title, or is uh, the lock title, or is lock title the default value? Um, it is. 
it, it does depend. Um, and even when it's log tighter, it's not always log base 10. Sometimes it's log base 2 uh, or log base 3, uh, which would be whatever the dilution factor, uh, the dilution uh, multiples were. It really, you can do almost anything. And the way you, the data scientists need to know is uh, they, they, they can go back to the source reports for the, the, the studies. So uh, for example, if you have, uh, if you, you, you should be able to find it either in the method attached to the contributing report or in the text about the results of what the, the unit is. There is no requirement for any specific one. It's just whatever was actually done. You just need to capture that in your units. Okay. And one thing to also remember too that with anything with SEND or SCTM, you, typically units are control terminologies as well. So, um. okay, thanks. Another question here for you, for you um, is, uh, is is the ADA required for SEND now? I think you gave a pretty clear answer on that, right? Mike, can you answer that one? Sure. Currently. ADA tends to fall in, into a document which we call the codex, which is kind of a limitation. However, that doesn't mean it can't be modeled, as you saw in our examples, how it send 3.0, we recommended modeling into the LB domain. A lot of organizations do do that currently. However, it is not required. So it's one of those things where since the send format is very usable for the FDA, a lot of people are still providing it. However, currently you're not specifically required. Some organizations have been opting to not uh, include it in an example, the LB domain, uh, as the IS domains are currently still in development and not really fully published yet. And most vendor tools aren't supporting IS domain as of yet. Uh, but that, so that it's kind of a, it's not required, but it is helpful. So a lot of people are trying to shoehorn it uh, currently to LB and then in the future IS domain. Okay. And it's likely to be required by the time we get to 3.2 because we're working on that explicitly. Correct. Okay. Good. Yeah, you also mentioned the the issues here on the IS domain. Can you elaborate here on the issues of the IS domain that still need work for clinical um, that are being addressed um, by the MB team activities? At this point, it's purely an operational. The pre the options we showed here for the uh, SEND 3.1, with the exception of not needing a subject row, are I currently identical to the IS domain recommendations under internal review at CDISC. Once CDISC completes that internal review, this will go out for public comment. This public comment period is absolutely essential for the ADA because we're trying to do something that is a little bit unusual for standard terms, where we're using three different fields to help uniquely identify a result so that we don't have duplicate rows, or rows that look like they're duplicate, but really aren't. Uh, and so we need people to try to break the system and to try and find a data set that they can't make work in, in the, the, the recommendation. So at this point where it is, is it's not that we need to work out a proposal anymore. It pretty, what you saw today is pretty much the proposal. It's just a matter of getting to the point where it is officially part of the IS domain, which would be after public comment period and CDISC CD uh, reconciliation. Okay, I think the last question uh, goes goes back again to to the title units. So, so how do you define these uh, title units? So, for example, log or percentage or SN. I uh, it uh, you don't need to define them because they were defined when the the samples were tested. Uh, if you're doing this proactively, it's just a matter of asking your your scientists uh, who are running the samples for the, the non-clinical study, what are their units? And you plug in what they tell you their unit is. Uh, and But what we were also trying to show is if it's a historical study or an in-license program, 
where the send database does not already exist, uh, you you may this is how you can reconstruct it because the data is frequently not included in the same limb system as the all of the in life animal data. Okay. Thanks for answering all these questions. So I, I think uh, just the amount of questions shows how, how interested um, our community is in, is in this uh, topic. And uh, thanks for, for, all the, um, for, for your presentations. Uh, also special thanks for, to, to Tim here. Uh, unfortunately, there was, no, there was no question to you today. Um, but uh, for, for everyone on the line here, um, please keep in mind that we will uh, post the recording uh, in our YouTube channel, and uh, this will always allow you to put um, some some comments or questions um, in, in um, to, to all these uh, presentations as well. We will do every effort in order to um, answer these questions. Um, please hold the date for our next webinar Wednesday, which is uh, scheduled for April 29th, uh, same time, same place. Um, until then, uh, we're looking forward to hear back from you. Uh, give us feedback. Uh, this is really valuable for us. Um, but uh, yeah, please stay healthy and uh, safe and sound and uh, looking forward to meet you again on this channel. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye.